But interestingly enough that we go that direction because I did have some stuff uh, that I have prepared on space travel in Libertopia. It is my firm conviction that we will never get off this rock with government. Government actively, intentionally or not, it actively inhibits space travel. It requires massive funding, and this requires a public will for that funding. And there has been no public will for space travel, not in any major way, since the end of the Apollo missions. In fact, they had more Apollo missions planned, but they lost the public will and therefore all the funding, and so they canceled them. And there has been no significant public will ever since. Um, Trump has this notion of a space force. Um, maybe that'll get off the ground but only because the Chinese are headed up there. And you do not want the Chinese controlling space. Um, that would be bad, okay? So that's going on there. I, I, you know, there's no real um, movement on that either than creating a, a, a general of the Space Force. Um, but there may be movement on it in the future. Um, hopefully... Somebody in Congress sometime has read uh, Heinlein's book, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. While it's not something we can presently exactly do, um, the way the moon gets their uh, independence is by lobbing rocks at Earth. You have a lot of rocks on the moon, and if you can accelerate them, uh, get them off into escape velocity, and make sure that your um, target and trajectory are right, you simply are dropping a big old rock straight into Earth's gravity well. It's a hell of a lot easier to drop something down Earth's gravity well than it is to get something up in Earth's gravity well. Um, so hopefully somebody's read that because that's outside of our capability right now, but it won't be for long. We'll be able to do stuff like that. I mean, they're starting to use rail guns on naval ships, which is a form of that technology. We'll be doing it eventually, and you do not want the Chinese up there because what happens is you're up there. If you don't have a big space capability, there's nothing you can do. You just sit down, get in the bunkers, and hope that you don't destroy it completely. In Heinlein's novel, they talk about destroying Cheyenne Mountain completely. Larry Larry says, Hal uh, had three more missions with all the hardware. Yes, the, they were ready to go with three more missions on the Apollo missions, and they were canceled because there is no public will for it and therefore no funding. Julie Thompson, hi, how did, nice to see you today. The Chinese are doing a lot to court Musk. I see, can easily see SpaceX moving there. Uh, talking about moon bases by 2022. Let me get into that because Musk... He's selling a bill of goods here. Um, I think in reality, private space travel will be doing the job. It will do it for a profit. Uh, in Libertopia, it would certainly be the case. You would be mining the moon, which is difficult. I'll explain that in a second. And certainly mining asteroids, but that's even more difficult. Um, there's probably not much profit in other planets. In reality, Mars kind of sucks. Um, Venus really sucks. The gas giants are totally inhospitable, although the rings of Saturn might be mineable. And the thing about space travel is one small mistake and you are dead. You know, life on Earth thrives because we evolved to, work, to live in this environment, right? None of that in space. You know, you, one tiny mistake and you are dead. Um, we are not built to live anywhere other than where we are right now. And you make one tiny mistake out there with any number of technical things, and you are dead. In terms of Mars, and here's where we get to some extent into the moon bases and, uh, and Musk. Musk talks about these moon bases, and people talk about these moon bases, and we don't know a lot of things to begin with. We don't know if the human body can adapt to Mars's lower gravity. What we do know is the human body does not function well in zero or near microgravity uh, because we have astronauts that come back from very extended missions from the ISS and they have serious 
permanently debilitating problems physically, and that includes things up to and including bone marrow issues, right? So surviving in microgravity, even for uh, the you know couple of years that they send those people up there, that becomes problematic. Uh, yeah, the Expanse books and TV series uh, show workers out in the asteroids. I've been catching up on that. I know that when I was doing reviews of this, occasionally people would ask me. I've been binging that. Um, uh, you know, they, they have asteroids and stuff that apparently are spinning. Um, in order to get that 1G, and sometimes, you know, when they're out, when they're out in space a lot uh, with very little gravity, except when they're under acceleration. Um, again, the problem is, and they don't address it in those books either, we don't know if you can survive in those. We just don't know. You know, what we do know is it's really bad in extended microgravity up in the ISS. Really bad. We don't know how it would be on a lower gravity planet. We don't know if we, could, we can live. We can, we can actually survive, for example, on the moon. Um, maybe that level of gravity is just enough. Maybe it's not. We don't know. That is something that has to be studied before we even think about doing this in a huge way. You need to send some people up there as guinea pigs, and if they come back completely screwed up or are screwed up while they're there, well, then we know we have a problem, and we don't have artificial gravity. We don't even have an understanding, really, of how gravity works. A lot of theories, but we don't really understand it. So we, that's, the, that's one of the biggest things. We just don't know if our bodies can stand that. Um, it may be that we are stuck with 1G, and until we can figure out a way to keep 1G around us most of the time, we are going to have problems. We just don't know. Uh, Larry Larry says, we thought our eyeballs would pop out during lunch. Yeah, I mean, there was, you know, all kinds of, you know, the, the reason Apollo 11 was the one that landed on the moon is because the first 10 were test vehicles. We'd never done that before. We didn't know if we could get something off the ground without it exploding. And in fact, a ton of stuff that we did send up did explode. Um, so they had to test being able to get it up in the first place. They had to be able to test whether or not you could put those vehicles on it. They had to be able to test whether or not you could dock those vehicles. Had to be able to test all of this stuff before you actually put somebody on the ground. And even when they did, if you know, if you listen to the radio transmissions and you understand what's going on in the background, Neil Armstrong was piloting that, first man on the moon, piloting that lunar excursion module down, running almost on fumes by the time he got. You can hear the ground control of Houston ticking off the seconds until he has no fuel. He barely made it. <laughs> um, if you know what's going on, it's really fascinating to listen to it, and, and still to me almost riveting, because you're going, okay, Neil, okay, Got to get it down now. <laughs> Run on fumes, Neil. Get the thing down, you know. So all of that stuff has to be tested, you know. Uh, when he landed, they didn't even know for sure. Nixon had a speech prepared in case they didn't make it, in case they died somehow. Our first people on Mars, without doing a lot more research, will almost certainly die, and not in good ways. Apollo 2 through 6 were unmanned test missions. Yep, that's exactly right. They, again, they had to, there were all these components that we had never made before, and they had to be tested out. It's things like people think about rotating space stations. Oh, that's got to be easy. No, no, it's not. There are five bajillion things that you would have to test out before you could put them together as a rotating space station. You can't just have a big blueprint, go up into space and build it. I mean, you know, most people don't understand how difficult it is to even use a tool in space, right? Here on Earth, if you want to use a, a, a wrench, you're working against gravity, right, to turn something. Up in space, in microgravity, you try to turn something, and all that's going to happen is you're going to move. <laughs> you have to have specialized tools, you know, in space. You get the, for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. You yank this way, that's going to cause you to move, not necessarily the bolt. So all of that stuff, you know, we, we can't, we, it's probably within our, uh, uh, you know, engineering capabilities to build something like that, but we couldn't do it all at once. We would have to test out individual parts for a long, long time before we got there. 
it's why the ISS is really a bunch of cobbled together pieces that, um, you know, we do a lot of testing up there, but nothing like you would need for a, a real rotating space station. It'll give you 1G by w virtue of centrifugal force. So other things that you have problems with on Mars and also uh, on, on the moon to some extent, radiation. There's very little atmosphere on Mars. It does not stop the deadly radiation that our atmosphere does. So you need to live in radiation-proof domes and wear rad-proof environmental suits whenever you go outside. You cannot make air. You would have to bring it all with you. You know, it's you have to, and, and ex recycling air is extremely difficult and is something that you lose more air as you do it. We can't do this at the moment. Um, and you could not do it with what you find on Mars. You cannot create an air that people can breathe based on what you have on Mars. You want air, you're going to bring it all with you. If you plan to colonize the planet, you're bringing all the air for that colony with you. And of course, water is very scarce on Mars. Um, there's some at the poles that we know about, so you could maybe colonize there. Um, but then you'd have to treat the hell out of the water. I guarantee Martian water is going to be filled with junk that people can't eat, can't drink. You can't just carve off a piece of Martian ice, melt it, and drink it. I'm dead certain there's got to be things in there because it's an alien planet. It's not one that we were uh, evolved to live in. I'm dead certain there are things in there that would be deadly to human beings, and you would have to treat the hell out of it. And uh, so unless you put colonies there near that that are capable of treating all that water, again, something we have never done, these are things you would have to test out before you send people there, otherwise their likelihood is they'd die. Uh, unless you do that and treat all that stuff, you're going to have to bring all your own water and then you're going to have to recycle it all. Fortunately, that's something we kind of can do right now. But for an entire colony, we have never tested anything like that. And food, um, you can't grow most crops on Mars. The soil is really bad. It's essentially uh, volcanic ash that has no nutrients that we need for plant life. Now, on Earth, in laboratories, they have attempted to replicate Mars environments and have grown things like... Uh, yellow sweet clover, carrots, field mustard, and leopard's bane. And that's about all. The soil just won't work for most crops. So if you want things like corn, you're going to have to bring the soil with you. Millions of tons of soil you will have to bring with you. And then you're going to have to put them in giant domes with air <laughs> that you're going to have to bring with you. Larry Larry says, Arnold uh, found uh, all that underground ice uh, we can vaporize to terraform Mars. Well, <sighs> terraforming a planet is something we have never attempted before. We don't know that we can do that. And if we did, it would probably take hundreds, if not more years. Um, that is an interesting sounding project in science fiction, but unless you have the Genesis device from Star Trek, it is not going to be anything like an instantaneous process. Um, Arnold uh, talking about that underground ice, yeah. Uh, from that movie, uh, no, no, that doesn't exist. Most of the ice that we know about on Mars is on the poles. We don't know that we could drink it. My guess is, you have to remember this is an alien planet. It's going to have alien things on it that we don't presently understand. I, I always like to point out to people, right, when I was first born, uh, from Earth-bound telescopes, scientists guessed that Mars would probably be habitable but a thin atmosphere, and that Venus would probably be habitable, but that it would be very jungle, very dense with jungle stuff. And then later on in my life, we sent probes and we found out the truth, that Venus is an unlivable place. Um, one of L. Neal Smith's book, called The Venus Belt, has a private company doing probably the best thing you could do with Venus. And that's smashing it with some object, some asteroid, so large that it turns the planet into an asteroid belt. <laughs> 
Um, that is probably the best use that we could think of for Venus. It is a completely uninhabitable place. Mars is largely uninhabitable. It's not as bad as Venus, where if you land on the ground, you'd, I don't, you couldn't even wear suits that would keep you alive more than a few minutes, and you wouldn't be able to move in them anyway. It'd just be a giant block of, I don't know what they use. To, they've gotten some uh, landers down on the planet. They don't last very long. So I don't know what they cover them with, but that's what you'd have to be covered in. Ten times thicker, you probably wouldn't move. So <laughs> you would have to, when you're colonizing Mars, again, if you want meat, you're going to have to bring your livestock with you, you know, in the hundreds or millions worth. Um, and we don't know if that livestock can adapt to Mars's lower gravity. Maybe they'd have problems the same as human beings might. We don't know. And you would need to feed them. You can't just grow grains there. You're going to have to build, bring lots of soil for feed grains and stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe you can get something like those few things to work in Martian soil, but very little. You know, corn, feed grain, feed corn, no. No, you're going to have to have soil that you bring with you, and you're going to have to put it down pretty deep because the roots from things like corn go down deep. And you have to bring a certain type of soil. You can't go out to South Dakota and pull up soil and bring it to Mars because that soil is such that will only grow grass. It is why it is a natural prairie. You have to go farther east into like Iowa, and then you have a soil that can grow corn and other crops. So you have to bring the right kind, you have to bring it in enormous quantities, and you have to constantly use water to get these things to work. So you have to constantly water them, you have to constantly water your livestock, you're gonna have to recycle all of that stuff and have to put the livestock in big old domes with air that you're going to have to bring with you, and lots of it. Um, you know, when you get into space travel, what Elon Musk is talking about sounds fun, but he overlooks all of these things that we have never, ever done any kind of research on. I think the best first step, if you're going to do something, and in Libertopia, I think that's what would happen with private companies, the best first step would be to try to set up a small base on Mars. I mean, I'm sorry, on Mars, on, on the moon, and send uh, astronauts up there for a long time and see what happens to them. You know, with the understanding, you tell the guys in advance, or girls, tell them in advance, you're almost certainly going to die um, from something. You know, if you screw up, if you make one screw up, technically everybody dies. If you uh, fail to, you know, make sure your suit is completely airtight when you walk out the airlock, you're going to die. You know, if your suit gets punctured by a micrometeorite, which happens all the time on the moon, that's another thing you have to worry about, both on the moon and Mars, is meteorites on, on the in, in Earth, we have this nice, wonderful atmosphere that's large enough so that you know meteorites of a certain size just burn up in the atmosphere. You have to get a pretty big one before they don't burn up in the atmosphere. And even then, by the time they hit the ground, they're not that big. You know, we always have the potential for a very large one uh, to hit Earth the way apparently killed off the dinosaurs. That's always a possibility. But you know, every day, I didn't even know how many micrometeorites burn up in the atmosphere and small meteorites just bang into the earth and make a small rock. On the moon? On Mars? No. No atmosphere to speak of like that. Not going to stop it. It's just going to slam right in. Micrometeorite the size of this coming in at you know the velocity of a bullet or larger, tears through your suit, you're done. You're just done. You're going to die. So for me, a first good step would be to put something on the moon, see if we can survive that gravity, see if we can, you know, even do things up there, see if we can recycle air, see if we can do anything in terms of growing food. Do we need to bring our own soil? What happens when we put livestock up there? What, you know, we don't even know for sure what happens if you grow corn in anything other than 1G. What happens to corn when it's in some other gravity? You know, will it even look like corn? Will it produce ears of corn in the way that we expect? We don't know any of these things. These are all things that have to be, you know, have to be tested. 
somewhere relatively near to us before we send them off someplace on Mars. Yeah, and like I say, I think the moon would probably be a good base. And uh, in Libertopia, I think we'd probably have that by now. Don't think we get the flying cars yet, although we might at some point. But imagine, again, we now have a government. They would be regulating the frack out of flying cars. Um, I can't even imagine. You know, I mean, just, just getting a trike, uh, which is, a, you know, a small, basically one-person aircraft. They call it a trike. Um, getting a trike, that has rules and regulations about it. Can you imagine a flying car, the kind of rules and regulations there would be? I mean, you would probably have to get pilot's licenses and all of that, and it would turn into just another small aircraft. So that's what I think about uh, space travel, um, Julie. And I, I, I hate to say that in this respect, um, Elon Musk is being something of a con man, but he is. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.